I'm here with Anatab Marti, who's the author of, or the co-author of The Banker's New Clothes. So what do you mean by that phrase? What are these? What are, the, are these new clothes that the bankers are But The Banker's New Clothes refer, refers to a collection of claims that are often heard mm. uh, in the debate on financial regulation and banking regulation mm. that happen to be flawed, misleading, from starting from completely nonsensical and false to kind of the more subtle ones that are just uh, mythical and mm. just people say them, but when you look more closely, they are not, something's wrong with them. Mm. And they're very heavily reliant on borrowing, aren't they, banks? This yes. is something that a lot of us didn't realise until we looked at the Lehman Brothers and these other banks that had a horrendous time in the crisis. They're incredibly reliant on, on, on borrowing, aren't they? And that, that's, yes. that's a problem. In fact, this is what's amazing when you look into banks in the context of the rest of the economy. Mm. The banks themselves would be reluctant to lend mm. to or deal with uh, businesses or corporations that borrow as much as they do. Mm. And so you wonder why it is that of the companies banks that we actually care mm -hmm. more that mm -hmm. they'd be safe, mm -hmm. they end up being the most highly indebted by far mm -hmm. of everybody else in the economy. And you stop and think, well, why is that? And the answer that you end up getting is precisely the following. It's because they want to and because they get away with it. Mm -hmm. That's why. Mm -hmm. There's nothing to recommend it, nothing necessary about it, nothing useful about it, mm -hmm. nothing efficient about it. Everything about it is wrong. Now, the argument we always hear here, and indeed from politicians, including the Chancellor George Osborne, is that if we force banks to raise more capital quite quickly, there's a real economic risk. They'll, they'll stop lending or they'll cut back on loans. Now, this is something that you discussed quite extensively in the book. That makes no sense because mm. this is a source of funding that they can lend. So we're forcing them to save their, conserve their cash, in other words, instead of paying it out, and then instead invest it. So we're telling them, go invest it, do something with it, and raise more equity, if you're a viable business, in fact, from markets at appropriate prices. Maybe you won't like these prices, but that's just maybe just tough. Uh, and then use it to invest profitably, including for lending. And to the banks that say, we can't possibly raise more equity, it, it's impossible, the markets won't wear it. What's the answer to that? The answer to that is, why is that? Why can't you raise equity? Why is it that every company that uh, needs to survive in this world, that has a business, must actually either use its own money or go to investors to get money, and nobody would lend to it if it got highly indebted? It has to tell investors that it has a, a viable business at 20 or 30 percent equity, and often with much more. In the U.S., it's common for, for many corporations to not borrow at all, hardly at all, and they thrive. Warren Buffett, a very successful investor, never pays dividends. He just keeps investing the money, and he wants investors to trust him. So are banks saying that we can't trust him to invest uh, equity money and they can't convince investors? If so, then we have to wonder about whether they are too opaque, too people are too scared of them, what's wrong with their business? In other words, let's worry about them actually doing what other businesses do, which is find profitable investments to make, convincing investors that they have those and showing them what, they, what they've got and where the risks are so that investors feel comfortable investing in them. And what's the role here of the idea that banks know and their shareholders know that if everything goes wrong, the state will bail them out. Have we, have we, there are politicians who believe we fixed that problem. Have we, we fixed the problem of, of banks being too big to fail? Where no, does that fit in? We did not. And in fact, that's part of what feeds and enables the banks to borrow as much as they do. That's how the creditors agree to give the money under terms that other people on their own couldn't get. So the mystery is solved, if you want to understand why, what, why they do what they do, is because it works for them. How they're able to get away with it is because the creditors agree to give them money under all kinds of terms. How is it, do you think, that politicians have, have bought all these arguments, have been convinced by these sort of bankers' new clothes arguments for all these years? How, how is it that politicians and regulators and central bankers seem to have been so mesmerised by, by these giant banks? There is some entrenched, there's a mystique of banking, as I said, and somehow people suspend judgment. And then they've developed uh, all these narratives about banking that, that one seems to never question, sort of accepts them. And some people may not understand. I've heard too many times that, you know, various people who I really thought should understand 
even don't understand. And some people actually don't have the background to understand. And then, you know, they get confused even by the words that they use. I'm very glad you never use the word hold or set aside capital because that's <laughs> what among the, the non-started nonsense, mm -hmm. which people don't even know what that we're even discussing indebtedness. They think that we're discussing some cash reserves that are set aside, and that is a completely different debate and a completely different set of trade-offs mm -hmm. than what we're talking about. We're talking about money invested, just not borrowed. Mm -hmm. So it's a kind of a crazy system where we forgot that what makes, while making something cheaper for them, we ourselves get to suffer the expense of having such a terrible system mm -hmm. of paying for the subsidies and then cleaning up when the things don't work out. One final question. How much of a problem do you think it is in public terms, that we haven't seen bankers called to account, put on trial, uh, you know, put in prison for, for, for what, you know, the catastrophic consequences that we've seen of the, of the crisis since 2007, 2008? We all have the sort of instinctive reaction that something's wrong with that, that there somehow should be accountability. But I'll say the following. These are legal issues about what you can prove and not prove about somebody's intent or what was in a small print of the contract. They can always have their lawyers uh, defend them. And so it's not clearly the solution. Now, I'll also say that whereas mis-selling and fraud might be associated with a lot with financial markets, we have them everywhere. You can have snake oil salesmen uh, sell you stem cell, you know, medicines and other things. So we always have that issue about, you know, buyer beware. Mm. Uh, of course, with risk, it's a little maybe more more complicated or maybe easier to, to, to miss-sell. But in any case, these problems are, there is a maybe a cultural problem, there is a problem of accountability. But fundamentally, what I'm actually proposing, this proposal that they have more equity, puts more liability and responsibility into this system, which currently there are some people, very few people, who benefit from upsides and of, of risks taken and leave downside for other people to deal with. They seem to have enjoyed the, the good times. For creditors and taxpayers, there wasn't even an upside, just a downside. How fair is that system? <laughs> I don't think it's very fair. <laughs> Anna Admati, thank you very much. Thank you very much for having me.